and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast alongside Ronnie Dahl. I'm Tyler Keeft on a family of TV and radio stations on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. Also live streamed online on CivicCenterTV.com. Additionally, we're on the radio on 89.3 Lakes FM, on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District under the leadership of Ron Whittables, their station manager, and, of course, Pat Watson, their superintendent, who we'll have on today at about 11.45 in the program. On 89.5 WAHS, Auburn Hills, that is WAHS 89.5, Avondale Community Radio out of the Auburn Hills area. We'll be speaking with a member of their Chamber of Commerce in Auburn Hills coming up in the first hour of the program as well. And we'll be talking to other great guests from around the Oakland County area about all of the top stories from the Oakland County area in regards to the coronavirus and other key stories in the area. Uh, making news today. So to do that, we're going to go to civiccentertv.com in our favorite browser of choice. Today I choose Google Chrome. We'll go to civiccentertv.com and click on the coronavirus page for all of our top stories and making news today. Zero COVID-19 deaths in Michigan for the first time since March reported on July 5th on Sunday. Michigan had zero confirmed deaths in connection to COVID-19. Uh, that is the first time in, uh, in since the very beginning in March of the COVID-19 pandemic that we have not seen a single death as a result of the coronavirus. Michigan reported 343 new COVID-19 confirmed cases yesterday and 398 new cases on Saturday. The new seven-day average for new cases in the state of Michigan is 374. Two weeks ago, it was 177. So again, stay vigilant. The number of total cases for Michigan is now 65,876 with 5,972 deaths. So the good news, Ronnie, is that we are not seeing as many deaths from COVID-19 uh, in recent times. Yesterday, of course, as was reported in this article, the first time since March that there have been a, there's been a zero death day in the state of Michigan. But that being said, the average has over, has over doubled uh, since uh, two weeks ago, and that's becoming a whole different problem potentially down the road. I think that's because we're seeing more and more young people become infected with COVID-19, and so they're not having the severe health risk associated with this. It's going to be interesting to see coming out of the 4th of July if those numbers continue to rise. We've all seen the video, or and just being out on the lake, I was out on the lake this weekend, Tyler, and it was pretty packed. Everyone was outside enjoying themselves. The weather was so hot too, as well. So people wanted to be out on the water. If they continue, if the deaths stay down, I wonder if the governor is going to move us into phase five. That's what I was wondering as well. And it looked for a while like they were gonna move us into phase five and the governor had a goal set to move us into phase five on or before the 4th of July. And of course, the recent spikes in COVID-19 is what is what took that out of the cards and seeing videos like we saw from Diamond Lake Sandbar in, in Cass County, Michigan over the weekend doesn't, doesn't add to it. The crowding we saw to a certain extent at the Jobby Nooner last week certainly doesn't help. And then there's also the cases we've seen in the recent weeks at bars and restaurants that are also contributing to the spike. Once again, though, remember what Dr. Faust said. If you're outdoors, it has less impact on our bodies and COVID-19 doesn't spread as much. So maybe because everyone was outside, we won't get the spike that we have in the past. So fingers crossed because I know a lot of people want to move past this and get into that phase five. Absolutely. Phase five would allow for more personal services such as gyms to be open as well. Uh, other news making news at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Wayne County Public Health Division confirms 13 COVID-19 cases linked to a Romulus bar and restaurant. Uh, 13 confirmed cases to the Playhouse Club in Romulus. 12 were employees or patrons of the club and one confirmed case was an employee of a Checkers. Wayne County Public Health Officer Carol Osterberry said, quote, it is imperative that all people who visited these two establishments during the exposure window call and cooperate 
uh, with our communicable disease team so that we can understand the extent of the outbreak. Uh, additionally, a big story today, interesting story. <laughs> I will story. say, I have to back up there for just one second. If men went there without their wives knowing, do you think they're going to report it? I don't think they're going <laughs> to report it to their wives. They're probably going to keep it under the wraps as much as they possibly can. But it's kind of tough to do that when you all of a sudden get COVID-19. So a little honesty is also uh, also probably in the cards in this situation. Um, uh, an, an interesting story, probably m one of the more interesting stories I've seen in the wild. Uh, a coin shortage is now impacting retailers and grocery stores throughout the United States. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a national shortage of pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Coin box supplies for retailers at banks are low, and banks have cut down on giving boxes of change out. The Federal Reserve announced a nationwide coin shortage in mid-June, saying, quote, in the past few months, coin deposits from depository institutions to the Federal Reserve have declined significantly, and the United States Mint's production of coins also decreased due to the measure put in place, the measures put in place, my, my apologies, to protect its employees, and, and closed quote. So, coin shortage is now affecting some local businesses. It's, it's interesting because you think you think during a pandemic that people aren't going to be using physical money as often because it's a surface that can transmit uh, the coronavirus, especially these coins that are made out of that are made out of metals and that's a th those are surfaces that COVID-19 lives a little bit longer on. That's a very interesting story to me. Don't you remember back in the beginning they were telling people don't use cash. Right. You want to use Venmo, your debit card, things of that nature. So I'm surprised by this as well. It's definitely one of the more interesting stories. We'll see if we can get any uh, information on how that's affecting some local retailers uh, here today or, or in the coming days as well. Michigan expects a booming demand for substitute teachers coming up. As Michigan school districts develop their plans for students to return to class in the fall, there will likely be an increase in the need for substitute teachers. President of Kelly Services, a school staffing division of Troy-based Kelly Services, Nicola Soros says, quote, it is, it is a mathematical certainty that we are not going to have enough teachers to reopen schools, and closed quote. Increased teacher absences are also expected due to covid 19. A drop in college aid requests in college aid requests is alarming educators. Michigan colleges and universities have seen a four and a half percent drop in applications for financial aid since last year. Overall applications for financial aid throughout the nation were down by 70,000 as of June 19th, which represents a 3.7 drop for the entire application cycle. The FAFSA, or Free Application for Federal Student Aid, is required for students to be eligible for fe federal Pell Grants and student loans as well. So around it's looking now like there are a, a significant number of students, maybe it's in part due to COVID-19 or other reasons before the pandemic, are not enrolling in schools and are not applying for financial aid as a result. I have heard some kids say that they're going to take a gap year because you are losing out on that college experience going back to campus with COVID-19 and all the precautions and everything that's going to be going on. Now, don't forget, you are supposed to be at school to learn and for your mm -hmm. education, but we know there are a lot of other things that go along with going to a college campus. So people are taking gap years, but then you have to also understand a lot of people, maybe their parents were laid off, they lost their jobs. So there is that side of it as well. A lot of factors going into why someone may not be going back to school in the fall and may take a gap year, gap semester or so on and, and wait the virus out. Lastly, among our stories at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, Michigan garage sales may, a Michigan garage sale may have exposed attendees to the coronavirus. Michigan health officials are worried that people who went to a garage sale near the community of Charlotte last weekend may have been exposed to COVID-19. As the garage sale season heats up across the state of Michigan, health officers Health officials are urging visitors to sanitize all bought items and to thoroughly wash and dry any clothes. Interesting move, uh, purchasing clothing at a, at a garage sale during this, th this time, but people gotta do it. People find something interesting that they like, and you just gotta take the, you gotta take the proper precautions, Ronnie, in this case, 
with anything that you're purchasing. I mean, you bring your groceries home from the grocery store, you're expecting those to already be clean as, as is, other than people maybe interacting with them on site at the store. You gotta think the same thing is going to go on at a garage sale. Right. Right, and not just a garage sale, but if you're using like Facebook Marketplace or Let It Go or Craigslist, things of that nature, all the similar situation that you're, you're exposed to whatever is on those items and it's coming from someone else's house. So it's, it's the same thing. We're, we're not allowing people outside of our family into our homes. So if you're bringing other items into your home, you have to make sure that it's not contaminated when you do so. There are a lot of different safety concerns to be, to be mindful of now, uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also as the seasons change and we're moving definitely, we're definitely in summer in Michigan. And to talk about some of those safety precautions that need to be taken, COVID-19 and other local safety information in our, in our general area is now joining us on the Megacast is Fire Marshal and Assistant Fire Chief from the Troy Fire Department is Chuck Reister with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Assistant Chief, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. So how are you? How's your team at the Troy Fire Department? Everybody's doing well, thanks for asking. Uh, with, the, uh, with the advent of uh, this disease, uh, we're still trying to deliver our services. Everybody is using as much uh, personal protective equipment as possible. Uh, they limit their exposure, so we're uh, moving right along. It's good to hear, and we haven't really had a whole lot of information. We haven't talked to the Troy Fire Department just yet. This is the first time we're talking to your department during this pandemic. Uh, how has the department been holding up during the pandemic? Every, every department seems to have had a different story of how they've dealt with the nuances of this pandemic. How has the Troy Fire Department done? Well, we are a unique organization in that we are mostly volunteer. We are what's uh, referred to as a combination department, a career and volunteer. We have about 11 career folks and they handle the day-to-day -day operations, the fire prevention aspect of the community, uh, the training of the uh, community risk reduction, uh, the maintenance of the stations and, and the apparatus. Uh, so that's what those 11 folks do. The 165 firefighters that we have are all volunteers and they respond to calls uh, 24 seven, 365. Those are the folks that uh, you have a problem, they come to your house. We've talked a lot with the West Bloomfield Fire Department, the Bloomfield Township Fire Department about different precautions they're taking, going out on calls, keeping COVID-19 in, in mind. Uh, your volunteer firefighters and your, and your full-time firefighters, what precautions are they taking as they're going out onto emergency calls in the local area, keeping the pandemic in mind? Yeah, they pretty much follow the guidelines of the CDC uh, and the Oakland County Medical Control. We're wearing gloves and uh, masks. Uh, we wear, you know, protective equipment, uh, whatever's been issued to us, we use, we follow the same hand washing procedures. We do the uh, social distancing. Uh, what we do is we try and limit the number of people that are first in to make sure that it's safe for them to enter or determine what level of uh, personal protective equipment they need to wear. Uh, and then we bring in just the number of people that we need. How are you handling all of that in the middle of this heat wave on top of it? <laughs> well, for us, it's a, uh, a daily, daily dealing. Uh, we, do, we have to do this, as all emergency responders do, in all kinds of weather. Doesn't matter whether it's hot or cold, it's rainy or sunny, uh, humid or dry, uh, we have to respond. When, when the community calls, we respond. So uh, we, we remind our folks to uh, hydrate, especially during this time of year, we remind them to wear the proper level of protective clothing, no matter how hot it's gonna be, and um, just think safe practices. Being joined by Chuck Reister, the Assistant Fire Chief and Fire Marshal from the Troy Fire Department on the Oakland County Megacast throughout the local area. The 4th of July weekend just passed. A record number of consumer fireworks were purchased and were shot off during the holiday weekend. Uh, did Detroit experience many safety issues or, or calls from the community? How did the community do in terms of safely celebrating the holiday? Actually, the, uh, the calls, the number of calls the fire department received were very minimal. We had a report of a grass fire. We had a report of a trash fire. Uh, we had no building fires. Uh, the department does not routinely respond to medical emergencies. We contract with uh, Alliance Mobile Health for that. But uh, just to, to kind of put this in perspective, 
the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, which um, tracks the data on injuries, uh, just released a report for 2019, and they indicated that there were over 10,000 injuries and 12 firework-related deaths that were reported in 2019. And what you have to remember is, those are the folks that actually went to an emergency room and received treatment for some type of injury. And this was during the month right around uh, the 4th of July, so they considered June the 21st to July the 21st, that time period. But what most people don't understand is that the, a large percentage of the injuries are to uh, children under the age of 19. And a good portion of those are between five and 14 years old. Um, now, I would have to ask you, um, do you what, what do you think is the device that causes the most injuries in that age group? Sparklers. Yep. It's sparklers, absolutely. People don't understand those things burn between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees, and then we light them, we hand them to a child and say, go run in the dark. So it's, uh, it's something that we need to be extremely careful with whenever we give any child a, uh, a lighted device. Chuck Raystor with us. He is the fire chief and the assistant fire chief and the fire marshal at the Troy Fire Department. So the holiday weekend's over. Fireworks are no longer legally allowed to be shot off by con consumers in the local area. Uh, but some people have some left over. Maybe they have some extra fireworks that they didn't shoot off, they weren't able to use. Uh, how, how do they go about safely disposing of those or storing of those properly uh, in their homes? Well, I would recommend, number one, that they, if they can store them, they not store them in the home. If they have a shed or they have a garage, store those there. Uh, put them in a dry place, and uh, they, they should keep just fine. There are uh, several times during the year where you can discharge consumer fireworks legally. Fourth of July is just one of them. Uh, Memorial Day is another, and Labor Day is coming up, so you can discharge them on that day as well. And you can discharge some on uh, uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Uh, those, those are pretty much the only holidays the state allows. They do allow them to discharge up to uh, 1145 at night, which uh, as a parent, I'm not real happy about, but <laughs> the law is the law. And, uh, you know, we, we just ask that if people have questions about how to use the devices safely, they can go on the Consumer Product Safety Commission website. They can contact their local fire department. And, uh, you know, we, we want you to enjoy the holiday. We just we don't want to see anybody get hurt. Assistant Chief Reister, up until recent weeks, we had some really good numbers in terms of COVID-19 uh, new cases and, and deaths in the state of Michigan. Uh, the, the, the death numbers have remained uh, pretty, pretty consistent over the last several weeks, but the new case numbers are significantly rising throughout the state of, uh, of Michigan in certain pockets. And uh, the average over the two week period, last two weeks, has nearly double, doubled from the two weeks before that. Since we've seen a lot of spikes, uh, and people maybe are letting their guards down, mask wearing has been more reluctant. How has this been affecting the city of Troy? It's got a very vibrant business, retail, and restaurant community. Has compliance been good between, of course, the residents and civilians that are visiting the city, and has, it been, has the compliance been good at these local businesses? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, it has been. We, we've, uh, we're not aware of any uh, severe cases where people are openly, openly defiant of uh, the governor's orders. Uh, even when they do the protests, uh, we've, uh, we keep an eye on the crowd and almost everybody is wearing a mask. Uh, I, I believe that, that you know, the people in, in Oakland County do a very good job of uh, following the governor's executive orders. Uh, one of the things people have to keep in mind is that even though the number of reported cases are rising, that coincides with the number of the amount of testing that the county health department is doing, and that number is constantly rising. So the more you test, the more cases you're going to find. The, the bigger question would be, if the number of cases are rising, how many of those cases have actually been hospitalized? So. Um, although the numbers are rising, I don't know that there's an increase in the lack of security to the individual, but as long as you're following the social distancing and wearing the masks, washing your hands, and all of, all of the health and safety rules, uh, for the most part, I, I think uh, we can maintain the, the flatness of the curve, as they say. As the fire marshal, how has your job changed during this pandemic? Well, uh, I, get, I get a lot more questions about code enforcement, what we can do, what we can't do. The executive orders have to deal more with 
um, the public health department than it does the fire department. In a lot of communities, the fire department is charged with providing EMS, and so they're directly related to it. But you know, we're, we're starting to see as businesses open, we're getting calls about how many people can I have in here? How can we safely do this? And a lot of that, you know, we have people rely on, obviously there's printed information from the governor's office and from the health department, but we want you to rely on, on good sense practices. You know, maintain that social distancing, uh, provide people with the opportunity to clean up as much as possible. The staff, every business that I've been into, uh, especially those that are considered public assemblies, the bars, the restaurants, um, the gathering places, the staff that's there is, is just doing a fantastic job of uh, wearing the masks and keeping people separated, keeping them happy, and, and just doing a great job of uh, keeping business going. Chuck Reister with us. He's the fire marshal and assistant fire chief at the Troy Fire Department. In terms of helping businesses maintain compliance and, and uh, put measures in place to be COVID-19 safe, how has the Troy Fire Department contributed to, to that from an educational standpoint, from an assistance standpoint, and getting these businesses to a point where they're ready, where they have been ready or are ready now to open to the public and, and, and enforce these guidelines? Well, what, what we do is we encourage the businesses to uh, reach out to us if they have questions. As I said, a lot of this stuff is just uh, applying good sense to this. And um, we have, uh, we've reached out on social media. I've got uh, a couple of um, staff lieutenants that work on Facebook and the other social media uh, platforms to get information out, to do short videos, to do educational information, uh, provide that to the community so that everybody understands where do we stand with this and how can we continue to be safe? Uh, Chuck Racer with us. He's the fire marshal and assistant fire chief at the Troy Fire Department. Uh, we're now in the summer season. Education, of course, is a huge component of what fire marshals and assistant fire marshals and, and fire departments uh, partake in in, in community relations standpoints. Uh, what are some common hazards that you see often in Troy or that other fire marshals throughout the local area may experience uh, over the summer as we're transitioning into the warmer, warmer months? And what are some ways that people can prevent these common safety hazards from becoming an issue in their homes? Well, probably, you know, the biggest one that uh, a community would deal with in the summertime with regards to the fire department uh, is going to be outdoor fires. People are always calling, you know, can I have a fire outside? What can I burn? How long can I burn? Do I need a permit? And every community is a little bit different. In the city of Troy, you're allowed to have what we refer to as a ground fire that would be similar to a campfire uh, as long as it's not greater than three feet around two feet tall and it burned seasoned dried firewood you can't burn yard waste you can't go and pick up all the uh, clippings that you just cut off the bushes and the trees and throw those in because they're going to generate smoke and next thing you know we're going to be getting phone calls from the neighbors i can't go outside i can't open my windows uh, a lot of having a, uh, a yard fire a ground fire is uh, about being nice to your neighbors too. You know, uh, we, we understand you wanna, you know, have that little campfire, you wanna invite some friends over, maintaining that social distancing, but uh, you know, be outside and, and socialize and that's great, but you wanna think about your neighbors as well. So, you know, if um, uh, probably one of the last things I'd mention on that is if you're gonna have one, make sure it's constantly attended by an adult. Uh, these things can get out of hand very quickly. Uh, we've been to garage fires, we've been to house fires, People will have a device on their deck. It'll let loose, set their deck on fire, and next thing you know, their house is involved. So as long as it's constantly attended, there's less of a chance anybody's going to lose property or get injured. Uh, Chuck Reister, the fire marshal for the Troy Fire Department, also their assistant fire chief. Anything else you'd like to share with us before we let you go? No, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, get this message out. You know, we want our community, we want every community to be safe. We want everybody to have a good time. But if you have any questions, if you're not sure, by all means, call us uh, in any community that you're in. Call your local fire department. They'll be more than happy to either provide you with the information. They might even come on out and help you figure out what you can do and what you can't do. Well, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Chuck Reister, the assistant fire chief and the fire marshal at the Troy Fire Department with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take a really quick break, and when we return, we'll be joined by the president of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce, who happens to be our Facebook partner today. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Michigan. 
We're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonae Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith alongside Ronnie Dahl. In the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV, the flagship stations here on the Oakland County Megacast network of community, television, radio, and internet outlets all throughout the Oakland County area. We're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and Civic Center TV. On Comcast Channel 15 and on AT&T Channel 99, we're also on 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. Those are our TV and radio stations throughout the local area, and each and every day we have a Facebook partner join us for the entirety of the program today. That is the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce, and we thank them very much for joining us today and thank their president, of the chamber, Gene Jernigan, for being with us once again on the Oakland County Megacast. Mega Gene, thank you for being with us today. Good morning. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? How's your team? Doing great. Doing good. Yeah, we're back in the office, so things are going really well right now. Everybody's staying healthy, so that's good, too. Always good to hear. It's been a while since we've last spoke to you, and there's been a lot of changes that have been made. A lot of businesses have reopened. How is the business community in Auburn Hill, in the Auburn Hills community holding up? Has the recovery thus far been fruitful for them? So far, yes, I am pleased to say for the most part, we've found that a lot of our local small businesses, especially in our downtown, have reopened and are finding that they're quite busy, but some are also still experiencing a little bit of a slowdown. So it just depends as far as, you know, with what's happening with relation to the phases for the state of Michigan. But at the same time, a lot of our larger businesses still remain in a work from home status. It just really varies quite a, quite a bit depending on the business. Have you seen the changes that have come through during this? Mostly like you mentioned working from home for these larger businesses. Have they seen an advantageous point of having people work at home during this? And is that something that they're going to continue on with going forward? You know, it's uh, it's interesting because we've done uh, quite a few just surveys and just asking our members some of the details as far as what they're experiencing and what they anticipate. And each is a little different depending on if they actually have a manufacturing floor or not. And for some of them, they are looking at a September 1 return, depending on obviously, again, the phases and what's going on in the state. But then at the same time, we have some businesses that have said that they will remain home until the end of the year, which is, um, you know, and then take a look at it then to see what works for them. 
So it really just depends. For a lot of, I think, some of the smaller offices, it has been um, an easier return just from the, just depending on the makeup and the layout of their business. But at the same time, I think that most of the members that we have, if they have an opportunity to have their employees work from home, they are still continuing to do so. Jane Jernigan is joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the president of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce, who also happens to be our Facebook partner today. So you had mentioned that some of the businesses that have reopened since we last spoke uh, to you a couple of months ago have had a, a, a pretty nice resurgence so far. Was that something that was expected, or was it expected that things were going to start off a little slower than maybe they have? I think some of the some of the businesses thought things were going to be a little bit slower, but then others that were anticipating their, you know, regular clientele to return. We've also heard that things have been a little bit sluggish from that perspective. However, what we're finding is, especially with our vibrant downtown, that businesses that have an opportunity to put out some tables and chairs outside and set up their outside patios, that they are experiencing a higher rate of, you know, people returning back to coming to patron their businesses. And I think that it just really, if you look at the dates, for instance, this weekend was a pretty even busy time. So I think that they experienced a great weekend from a 4th of July perspective. So, yeah. Gina, if I can ask you, what impact do you think this is going to have on the real estate market in the area long term? We're seeing some houses are selling like crazy, but then I wonder on the commercial side, are some of these businesses going to continue to work from home and then not have a regular office setting? Mm -hmm. I know. Gosh, that's a great question. Actually, um, my husband is a realtor, so do hear a little bit more about that and it's funny because you hear on the news right now that the market is a little sluggish however he has been busier than ever and i think that um just it really depends but houses are selling so fast and they turn around very quickly right now and so i think yes maybe with some people working from home they might be looking for something of a little bit of a different setup for what they are currently in, but at the same time, some are also looking to downsize to make their lives a little bit simpler. So we just actually had a member, the owners of Michigan by the Bottle and Blue Skies Brewery, which is located in downtown Auburn Hills, they just did that. They actually downsized and bought a new condo that um, we have townhomes that are built just on the outside of downtown, and they're beautiful, and they live right downtown by their business. So we have a nice walkable community. And I think that that's something that people are really trending to find to like to be able to do. Jane Jernigan joining us. She is the president of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce. With us on the Oakland County Megacast, the Auburn Hills Chamber, also our Facebook partner on today's program. And we thank them very much for partnering with us today and, uh, and bringing the Oakland County Megacast to their many, many followers on Facebook. So give them a like, give us a like, and show your appreciation for the Oakland County Megacast. So, Jane, you, you mentioned the real estate market in Auburn Hills, and there's some very interesting real estate that is uh, changing its face, so to speak, com coming up very soon. Uh, we've seen the pictures of the Palace of Auburn Hills, of course, that's being torn down, and there, there's new businesses coming in there. As a uh, as a rabid Detroit Pistons fan, it's devastating to me, but also as a fan of the city of Auburn Hills and their business community, I know it's great for the future of the community. What is going in at the Palace of Auburn Hills site, and how's that going to benefit going forward the business community in the city of Auburn Hills? Well, actually, so I will first mention that the Detroit Pistons are partners of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce and still remain strong partners with us. In fact, we have a gentleman who is the senior VP of sales for the Detroit Pistons who serves on our board, Brad Lott. And I would say that I, I have no idea right now what is actually going on that space, but it has been zoned for um, manufacturing, R&D, and with the number of acres, they have an option to either parcel it off or they can actually buy the whole land outright. So they're clearly trying to get that 
you know, structure down. And right now, I don't know if you've driven by it recently, it kind of looks like an alien s structure. It's very interesting, <laughs> but, uh, but they're, they're definitely taking it down piece by piece. So hopefully within the next year or two, we'll, we'll see what ends up being purchased and put in that space. Definitely an interesting developing story out of Auburn Hills. What's going to be going on at the Palace site? So Jane Jernigan, president of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce with us on the Megacast. We've had a lot of scares recently with upticks in COVID-19 cases, particularly at gathering places such as bars and restaurants. Any concerns with compliance from local businesses uh, in enforcing social distancing guidelines, capacity issues, and, and so on? Because it creates a, a business dilemma also where you want to keep your business incoming with, 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 uh, without putting safety at risk. And, and But there's also a business risk because if you're pushing people away because they refuse to wear masks, you're losing a sale or, or potentially multiple sales down the line. How is Auburn Hills holding up with that dilemma? You know, I have not experienced any issues from the perspective of the businesses locally mentioning or saying anything about uh, people not being compliant with the mask wearing. However, I think we all know that clearly people, there's some people who just do not like to wear them. But for the most part, when we have been out walking around, looking and talking to the business owners, for the most part, they have been very structured with the compliance as far as making sure that everybody is wearing their masks. And at the same time, we have experienced and seen that people are doing that. So I know that, you know, there's been different reportings and, and you know, news stories lately of people who just refuse to do that, but I have not experienced it here. So we, you know, as far as looking at the way that they've set up the businesses, everything is set up, you know, so it's well within the social distancing parameters. And we actually, our city of Auburn Hills actually put in a pop-up square. So if you want, you can actually go and purchase and take out items, either beer, wine or um, meals and go sit at the pop-up square. And there's nice tables and chairs and umbrellas set up over in that area. It's a really nice environment for everyone. COVID-19 has turned the world upside down, but as someone who has their pulse on the business community, what types of businesses do you think are going to surge and what types of businesses are going to decline? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I would say just from, at least with the ones that we are working with, technology has definitely surged. I think that um, healthcare, anything healthcare related is also surging. But then at the same time, what we're, you know, what we're experiencing and seeing that are obviously just challenged right now is our hospitality, any of our retail. And those are the ones that, you know, some of them obviously they've reopened and they're just as busy. And for those that were able to go online with their um, with items, if they are somewhat product based versus service based. You know they have done they've been able to survive however i think that just if you you know look at the environment as far as the funding that's needed to help businesses stay with the paycheck protection payroll protection program that's been helpful um but that's what i would say are the businesses that we're hearing from that are, are a little bit challenged right now so, and you know, some of our nonprofits at the same time where I, you know, again, I know that we've been dealing with this now for a number of months and the nonprofits definitely could use some attention and some, some fundraising love just because, you know, they've been trying to do their fund, their normal fundraising virtually. And I've, from my understanding, we have heard that that has been challenging. So I, I realize now with everyone, uh, you know, just obviously struggling depending on unemployment and the situations where normally we would be a very, and, and have always been a very giving society. I think that this is a time when people are tending to keep things a little bit closer to the chest and just waiting to see what's gonna happen right now. And understandably for sure. Um, but I'll just give a shout out to our nonprofits that I'm sure could use some extra fundraising help Jean Jernigan with us. She's the president of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So to, to kind of go back to the COVID-19 numbers and some of those concerns they've brought up, um, Governor Whitmer last week announced that bars would be shut down to indoor alcohol service. We've seen um, a lot of bars throughout the state of Michigan in, in East Lansing and Royal Oak and, and other places that have had uh, 
pictures surface of people that are very packed into those local businesses and are maybe not wearing the masks, does that present concerns to your local eateries and these local bars and restaurants that they could end up seeing a potential sh shutdown again in the future if people in the communities are not being careful? For sure, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, there's always the possibility, of course, right? We're seeing it in all the other states right now. And I think that the local businesses are very hopeful that, um, that, that people will be compliant and will do what they're supposed to, of course, just so that we do stay on this lower trending uh, rise of COVID at this point. So we'll see what happens. I, I, none of us have that, you know, mirror ball looking, you know, none of us know for sure what's gonna happen. And so that's where it's the biggest challenge I think right now, but so far takeout in our little area has been working fairly well. And it hasn't been every single bar. It hasn't been a widespread problem. It's been a lot of these isolated incidents that have then been contact traced and led to these what we've seen these in terms of these surges in COVID-19 related incidents. So in terms of other bars that have been compliant, that have been enforcing social distancing guidelines and have been maintaining capacity, what was the reaction, at least in the Auburn Hills from your knowledge or maybe commu other communities that you've been uh, in contact with to the decision from the governor to on a broad level restrict indoor alcohol service? You know, I, I would have to say and now that this has been going on for quite some time, I think that there obviously is some frustration, but rightly so, just from the perspective of it's your business and you put your livelihood into it. And so it's challenging when you can't function and serve your normal clientele. And it gets confusing when the, um, you know, when things change so quickly, but we are experiencing something like we've never experienced before. And from that perspective, they are creative and they've done what they can to, you know, obviously still help to serve their clientele that they really have grown to hopefully know and love. And at the same time, you know, if you check their websites, it really does keep you updated as far as what they're doing. So some of them locally have gotten pretty creative and we still have some that have just remained closed at this time. Gene, if I can ask you, we are seeing more and more people stay home, remaining close to their community. And instead of traveling to other states or up north, if they wanted to visit Auburn Hills, what are the top two, three, top two or three things you would say they need to see and they need to do? Oh, that's, that's a great question too. So we, one of the beautiful things about Auburn Hills is our parks. We have some very nice small parks that um, would provide with a nice walkability. Actually, you can walk you know, right through downtown Auburn Hills. I would say that just stopping through the downtown and just walking through is a great opportunity. There's a number of little shops that are open and at least you could stop and get a growler to go or grab some packaged beer and wine. Um, I also think that, you know, if you're looking at the Auburn Hills campus, the city of Auburn Hills campus, there are, are opportunities, there's walking paths that, are, that go through there. And we actually do have a nice long stretch of the Clinton River Trail, which is beautiful and is a great opportunity to just take your bikes and, you know, ride around on the trail, stop and get some ice cream stop and check out the river and, and look for the fish and maybe just enjoy yourself, enjoy the outdoors, right? Absolutely, we have a lot of really great parks in, in all the communities that we're, that we're serving here on the Oakland County Megacast and Auburn Hills certainly is one of those communities with some excellent trail networks and excellent parks to go and visit on top of those other local businesses in the community as well. Gene Jernigan, the president of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce with us on the Oakland County Megacast. There's still a lot of challenges to be tackled going forward for these businesses. The resurgence of the economy in the state of Michigan and in the United States, especially in terms of small businesses, is far from over. What do these businesses need to be doing going forward to continue to have the, the successes that they've already been sort of experiencing as they've reopened and capitalize on that going forward. And the one of the things I think that they could that everyone obviously is working very hard at doing is keeping the outward communication 
lines open. And I think that that is so strongly important for all of us that are, you know, still maybe so many people are working from home and so many people are actually not having an opportunity really or wanting to get out. And I think maybe from that perspective, some of our businesses have found a way to be creative. And, you know, one of the things I think we had um, talked prior to this about maybe some of our local gyms, and it was a question I wasn't really going to address, but I would say this, that it has been an opportunity for a number of our local gyms to go online, and they still continue to do that. And they're offering challenges that you can sign up for, like a monthly challenge or a four-week challenge. And it's something that's fun, and it's exciting, and it's something you can still do with your family. Um, and then for the retailers, you know, our mall remains open and there are a lot of opportunities that some of our businesses, I think now is the time for everybody to start pushing out again that outward communication. But as we head into July and August in Michigan, obviously it's a quieter time. So it, you know, it gives us an opportunity maybe to take a, take a breather, take a breath and go visit some of your local retail establishments that maybe, you know, put your mask on and, and go out and patron shop small so shop local jean jernigan with us she is the president of the auburn hills chamber of commerce just a couple more minutes before we have to let you go going forward what do you expect to be some of the biggest challenges that our local business community especially the small business community are going to have to face as the pandemic continues I would say that probably similar to what you know you see that we've experienced these last three months, I think that if we continue or if we have another surgeons, we will see that some of our small businesses will start to close or will find different things that they might, it's, it's gonna go one way or another. But I do think that, um, you know, obviously it's been economic challenge for all of us and especially for some of our smaller businesses. But at the same time, if there was times when they were not already getting creative with technology, now would be the time to do so, for sure. Jean, anything else you'd like to say before we let you go? I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been great talking to you and we really appreciate the opportunity to showcase our beautiful community. We well, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Have a great day. You as well. Jane Jernigan, the president of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce, our Facebook partner on today's program. And really interesting to get a perspective from the Auburn Hills business community because it mirrors a lot of our other local communities. The business communities in all the, the local area here in Oakland County have very similar ins and outs and, and different kinds of businesses. So hearing the perspective of Auburn Hills and some of the struggles that they've been dealing with and some of the challenges that they're dealing with and overcoming, it gives you a good perspective on what a lot of these other businesses in the local area can be doing going forward in order to continue to have some success uh, as the pandemic continues. I think this is a really important time for all of us to remember our small businesses. If you drive by your big box stores, a Walmart, Target, Menards, the parking lot is always packed but it's those little stores that you can actually get the the best gifts the you know the unique items that are homemade or unique to your area and when you give those as gifts they mean more to the other people too so now that we're able to get out and actually go into these stores and shop these businesses it's going to be i think vital going through the summer months to help keep them afloat to get them through this next phase if we do go into a next one. And I think people also really understand that these local businesses are their community's economy and keeping them alive, keeping them strong is keeping your community strong as well. It keeps those programs that you love in your community like parks, like park services and so on alive and well. And on top of that, you get that personalized service I think that you don't get at larger, at larger conglomerate companies or regional companies as well. Uh, because they know you in many cases or they know your community and it can help you with what you're looking for and tailor to your experience being from Auburn Hills, being from Troy, being from West Bloomfield and so on and so forth. It gives our community its identity. It makes us separate and different and unique. So I love to buy the little gifts that say, you know, Kegel Harbor or Sylvan Lake little things like that mean more and if they go away the uniqueness of our little communities go away as well i would agree with that entirely uh, entirely ronnie we're going to take a very really short break we'll check in 
with Erica Jones out in the field next on the Oakland County Megacast. You're listening to us on a family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after this short break. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hello, I'm Dr. Betty Chu, Chief Quality Officer at Henry Ford Health System, and I'm with Wright Lassiter, Henry Ford Health System's CEO, to talk about coronavirus. In uncertain times, it's natural to have questions. So I'm going to ask Dr. Chu to answer some of the common ones. First, why can't I visit my grandma to see if she's okay? Because the elderly are at a higher risk for complications with this disease, and you could inadvertently infect her. If I'm healthy, why can't I go out with my friends? The larger the crowd you're exposed to, the higher the chance you could get infected and infect others. If I have symptoms, why do I have to seek care? While the disease isn't dangerous for most people, for others, it can be. We need to understand how serious your case is because the right choices save lives. For more information, visit henryford.com or call 313-874-1055. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. The Megacast also on WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio, 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Today, the show also on Facebook via Facebook Live on the channel of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce. We just spoke to Jean Jernigan, and we thank her and her entire team for being with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Our Facebook partner is the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce. Out in the field with us today, we have Erica Jones, as always, with us at a local business. Erica, what's going on out in the community? Hey, Tyler. I'm at Sylvan Market on Orchard Lake Road here to talk about what we're seeing with the coin shortages going on in retail operations and really just how liquor sales have been during the whole pandemic. So I've been talking with their owner, Harry, and he's going to give us an update. Nice. So, hi, thank you for hi. talking with us. So, you know, just tell us how has your business been during the pandemic? How have liquor sales been? Well, liquor sales picking up a lot and uh, we're busy and we're doing good. And But the issue is we got a little problem with the bank. We can't get the coins. It's a little bit tough. People, they, they walk in, they want to know if we can, you know, accept cash anymore. And they've been getting a hard time. A lot of people that don't have no credit card. A lot of people. There's, there's a lot of different ways on this. Yeah, and I know you and I were talking earlier, and you told me you haven't yet run into the issue of not having enough coins for people, but you said they are running low. Are you concerned that this could become an issue soon? It's going to be a really issue. Then I'm going to come with a coin because I've been here from friends and all the business people. They can't get the coin from the banks. The banks next door, they take care of me, they look out for me, they give me a little bit here and there, but we're just short. 
a lot of coins a lot of time. Yeah. So has the bank warned you that they might not be able to give you coins for long? Well, so far, not it's not too good, really, but they don't know exactly. So we'll find out. I hope everything is going to run up nice, clean operation for everyone. Yes, but at this point, you are still accepting cash, and it hasn't been too big of an issue? Yes, we are. All right. And then just overall with liquor sales, how would you say this year has compared to other years? Are there significantly more sales this year than you've seen in the Well, past? the liquor stores, yes, it does, uh, because got restaurants closed, clubs closed, um, golf course closed. So we start picking up a lot of liquor. But last couple of months, we were cut down our short hours at the business. But all in all, it was, it's really pick up. Yeah, and are you still having short hours here, or are you back to normal? No, I'm back to normal. All right, well, yeah, is there anything else you'd like to share about yeah, your business? We're or? really short with a lot of liquor from state. We got a little bit short. We can't get our liquor order. We put a order, let's say, a $50,000 barrel, get ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 liquor order. So there's a big issue going on to the state. All right, well, thank you so much. We You're really welcome. appreciate you talking with us. Thank you. All right, Tyler, there you go. Erica, anything else from Mountain Field? No, not much. It's good to see that they're not completely having the issue with no coins here. But, you know, like Harry told us, they could run into that issue soon. So people should be ready to not be able to use cash because it looks like that's the direction we're headed in. It's been interesting to see at these local businesses how social distancing guidelines and, and mask wearing has been either put in place or has been enacted by customer by customers. How, from your evaluation, have things been out where you're at? Good here today. The employees are masked up and the few customers that I've seen in here, I am as always. And yes, they are all as Harry is showing us here, they all wear their masks and they have gloves on as well. It's very nice. Good to hear, Erica. Thank you very much for that report. Thank you. Erica Jones with us out in the field in the local area, giving us an update on uh, this coin shortage that's really going to start affecting these businesses. You don't think about it as much because a lot of people aren't paying with physical money during the pandemic. And even before the pandemic, it wasn't all as common as it had previously been, I don't think, to see a lot of people paying with physical money in the form of dollar bills or in the form of of coins and now you're seeing that affect these businesses because as they are giving people change and as people are keeping that with them and not using that physical money it's not being redistributed out into the system the the u.s mint isn't distributing as much as they used to according to the articles that re we've read and that's going to start to affect these businesses because they're not able to electronically necessarily give out this money in form of change to people who no, who normally would be getting cash from them or, or coins back. This entire pandemic has really opened our eyes to the uh, supply chain and how things operate. And when you put one kink in that, it can throw everything out of whack. So obviously we saw it in the beginning with the toilet paper and now we're still seeing it with Lysol and Clorox but now it's hitting the money. I found this really surprising because I was kind of like, who actually uses cash anymore? Right. I mean, I think, especially the younger generation, they're mm -hmm. definitely all card, Venmo, like you can pay with your watch now, which I like, like if you're out running or yeah. exercising, you could just do that. You don't have to actually carry cash. So I was surprised that this is as big of an issue as it is so when i was out shopping this weekend almost every single store had a sign asking for exact change because of this shortage yeah it was something i didn't really even think about until reading the article today and, and seeing those signs over the weekend asking for exact change if people can provide it because like you said you're not seeing people necessarily paying in cash anymore paying with exact change and you don't really think about it until you think critically about it that when people are receiving dollars and coins from grocery stores and, and from other retailers and, and from liquor stores and so on, and they're not putting that back into the system, that's being essentially taken out of circulation. So it's not getting redistributed just by circumstance as it always had before to these businesses. And now they're in a point where, oh no, we're not, we're not gonna be able to give out change to people How's that going to work? And I think the next, the next interesting innovation we're probably going to see come for these retailers 
is how do they, in a way, give out electronic change, possibly, uh, seeing that this probably isn't something that's going to be a necessarily high priority for the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Mint getting more cash and coins into circulation. Some of the stores do have, like, the the coin star where you can go in and cash in your change, and I think some of them are just keeping that instead of going to the bank and trying to get rolls of, of coins and change. So I guess if you're sitting at home on a lot of change, because it's almost a habit for us that we come in and we dump it in a bucket. Right. So help your retailers out if you have that. Go in and, and, and find one of these stores and cash it in and, and help them out and get a few dollars in your pocket as well. And it makes me feel a little bit bad because I went out yesterday. I, play, I played some basketball midday, and I went and grabbed a, another water bottle or so from uh, one of the local grocery stores, and I got change back. And it makes me think, you know, maybe I should go back over there and like pick up a pack of gum or something and, and pay, with cha- pay with some coins, help them out a little bit. It's a tough situation, and uh, hopefully, hopefully there will be some sort of a resolution that helps these local businesses out and doesn't uh, put a, a greater burden on the system as we're seeing a coin, a, a coin so- shortage all throughout the United States has been warned by the Federal Reserve and some businesses, as Ronnie had mentioned, are now asking customers to pay an exact change, if at all possible. So we'll go through our top stories of the day in just a couple of minutes, and then li- and in, in a few minutes we'll be joined by U.S. Senator Gary Peters on the Oakland County Megacast. You're listening to us on 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills, and 89.3. 5 WAHS Auburn Hills that is WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio the Oakland County Megacast also today on Facebook Live on the page of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce and we thank them for joining us on the program today Ronnie and I will return after this short break and more on the Oakland County Megacast thank you for tuning in Michigan we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hello, I'm Dr. Faust, medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. Coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 is a new disease caused by a new respiratory virus named SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 was first identified in December 2019. There is currently no vaccine to prevent coronavirus disease 2019. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before eating, and after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces using a regular household cleaning spray or wipe. Avoid close contact with people who are sick and avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue then throw the tissue in the trash. Finally, stay home when you're sick. For more information about coronavirus disease 2019, go to oakgov.com health or call one 800 848-5533. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith alongside Ronnie Dahl on our family of TV and radio stations on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and on Civic Center TV. Those channels on Comcast Channel 15 in your local area and all throughout 
Oakland County in the metro area on AT&T Channel 99 under their, under their public access government and educational programming guide. You'll go into that, you'll log right on in, and you'll have a choice of a list of different community stations. You can choose Birmingham Area Municipal Access or choose Civic Center TV. It is based on the community that you're in, so first thing you'll have to do is go to your city, your township, or your village of choice. But Civic Center TV in West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake and Orchard Lake Village. And Birmingham Area Municipal Access in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the Village of Franklin. We're also on 89.3 Lakes FM, live streamed online on lakesfm.com. 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, out of the Bloomfield Hills School District, and WAHS 89.5, Avondale Community Radio, out of Avondale High School in Auburn Hills. That under the leadership of station manager Marty Schaefer and technical engineer Keith Fraley keeping us on the air each and every day joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Our family of stations including a Facebook partner each and every day and today that Facebook partner is the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce. A very interesting interview earlier on in the show with their president Gene Jernigan. You'll be able to find that interview later on today on our website on civiccentertv.com. You click on Megacast and it's going to take you to this page. You'll get information on our partnering TV and radio stations and you'll also be able to watch Watch full episodes, short clips, and entire interviews from today's and, and past episodes of the Oakland County Megacast. So if you tune in halfway through the interview with Gene Jernigan, you'll be able to watch that on civiccentertv.com slash megacast later on in the day. You'll also be able to go to short clips if you're only able to join us for a few minutes for one interview, but you want to hear from Senator Gary Peters, who we'll, st who we'll be talking to in a few minutes, or Pat Watson later on in the show about what's going on in the Bloomfield Hills School District and how they're reacting to the governor's My Safe Schools plan and, and what's going on to their bond issue coming up for a vote later on. You'll be able to watch that full interview or hear those short clips later on today on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Also on civiccentertv.com, if you click on our coronavirus link, you'll be able to see today's top stories. We update this for you. On the daily, and one of our top stories today, coronavirus tracker shows zero COVID-19 deaths in the state of Michigan for the first time since March. That occurred yesterday. On Sunday, July 5th, Michigan had zero confirmed new deaths connected to COVID-19. That's the first time since March that that's been the case. Cases are still on the upward trajectory, however, with Michigan reporting 343 new COVID-19 cases yesterday and 398 new cases the day before on Saturday. The new seven-day average for new cases is 374. Two weeks ago, that was at 177. But of course, with an increase in testing, you see more pop you'll see more cases coming through. And we're also seeing less hospitalizations and deaths, as it was also reported last week by Dr. Jonay Caldoun at Governor Whitmer's press conference that the, the new problem demographic for COVID-19 cases is now in the ages of 20 to 29. People are going out the bars and they're not social distancing. They're not being as cognizant of the need for safety measures to be taken in regards to COVID-19 and their bodies are less susceptible to maybe the severe symptoms that put you in the hospital and put you on a ventilator. That being said, still very necessary for, for people in that age group to take precautions because while it may not affect someone severely in one case, there may be another case where your particular body is not as, as apt to deal with COVID-19 uh, as someone else's is, and maybe you do end up on a ventilator despite being within the ages of 20 to 29 years old. Other stories on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Wayne County Public Health Division confirms 13 COVID-19 cases linked to a Romulus bar and restaurant. As Michigan COVID-19 cases are seeing an uptick in numbers, Wayne County Public Health Division confirmed 13 cases uh, connected to Playhouse Club in Romulus. 12 were employees of the club and one was a confirmed case of an employer of a checkers nearby. Wayne County Public Health Officer Carol Osterberry said, quote, it is imperative that all people who visited these two establishments during the exposure window call and cooperate with our communicable disease team so that we are able to understand the extent of the outbreak. Also, another big story today we just talked about with Erica Jones and a local retailer 
There's a coin shortage impacting retailers and grocery stores throughout the country. COVID-19 has created a, a number of shortages uh, in, in other products, but now we're seeing a shortage in pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Coin box supplies for retailers at banks are low, and banks have cut down on giving boxes of change out into the community. The Federal Reserve announced a nationwide coin shortage in mid-June, saying, quote, in the past few months, coin deposits from depository institutions to the Federal Reserve have declined significantly, and U.S. Mint's production of coins also decreased due to a measure due to measures put in place to protect its employees so that going to continue to develop over time as uh, as these retailers we've been talking about Ronnie are, are very much affected by the loss of, of physical change and, and cash on hand as it's going back out into the community in the form of of change on purchases but isn't being used to purchase items and going back into the system this is a good time for anyone that hoards their change to take it into a local retailer and cash it in. Plus, it clears out your house. It does. It, it helps, to, helps to clear clutter. So good idea if you're going out to your local grocery store and other business to uh, you know, bring some cash with you, bring some change with you, make sure you sanitize it as best as you can before you go out in, the, in an abundance of caution. But help your local retailers out a little bit. They're, they're definitely looking for those coins and those, and those extra dollar bills in order to provide change for other products that people are purchasing as well that and more news stories updated daily on our website civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus from newsmakers all throughout the local area and we have an, another newsmaker coming up right now well, u.s senator gary peters now joining us on the oakland county megacast senator peters thank you for taking time with us today how are you how's your team uh, i'm well it's great to be with you hopefully both of you are staying healthy and safe we are doing our best. Thank you very much for, for your good. good words. So COVID-19 has obviously presented a, a number of challenges to the government on all, on all levels. From a federal standpoint, what have been some of the most significant challenges that, that you and other senators and, and representatives have been facing? Well, they, they, it's been a long list, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, I've been in the center of this uh, uh, to a considerable extent as a result of the fact that I'm the ranking member, which means I'm the top Democrat on the Senate Homeland Security Committee. And in that committee, we oversee FEMA. And of course, that's the federal emergency management folks who are entrusted with the, the federal response. And so uh, I've been uh, involved on a daily basis. Uh, my committee staff talks with FEMA folks uh, daily. Certainly our, our biggest challenge initially, especially here in Michigan as one of the hotspots in the Detroit area in particular, uh, was just making sure we had basic supplies like basic uh, personal protection equipment for our healthcare providers. And in the initial stages, uh, we had a scramble everywhere to try to make sure we had the, those supplies coming into our state, testing supplies, uh, which uh, continues to be, be an issue, but we need to be able to know who has the disease and who doesn't, and then do the contact tracing. So all of those supply issues and the supply chain, which unfortunately, uh, is pr primarily relying on foreign producers for some of the, the key equipment we need from, from medical uh, supplies to life-saving drugs. Uh, we have an over-reliance on foreign providers. We've got to take that back. We've got to bring it back to the United States. It's a very clear lesson. And in fact, it was a lesson that I, I put out last year. I put out a, a, a report from Homeland Security talking about drug shortages and the fact that we're over-reliant on foreign producers. And and when there's a pandemic, uh, we're going to face a very critical situation. And here we are uh, in the pandemic. It's no longer theoretical. It's uh, real. Uh, and we have to come together in the months, years ahead to make sure that we have a more secure supply chain for critical supplies that we need to, to, uh, uh, to deal with the pandemic and what will likely be future pandemics. U.S. Senator Gary Peters with us on the Oakland County Megacast. You talked about earlier on in the pandemic when you're, you're – when, of course, the state of Michigan and other states throughout the union, really all states in the union, were facing massive shortages in PPE. Right. And that created some competition to a certain extent between the states. And on a federal level, as you and, and other members on, the, on, your, on your committees and within the federal government are working to solve these issues, you have to be able to put politics aside in order to help not only your state, but other states. During the pandemic, have you, have you seen that the polarization that we're experiencing in our country has kind of been put maybe to the wayside to, to solve these issues? Or has that continued, that gridlock continued to be an issue in, in solving a lot of these major problems? 
Well, some of it we put together. I mean, obviously the, the CARES Act, which was a major support. Uh, we talked about uh, supply shortages, but clearly uh, we have to, in addition to dealing with the public health crisis, we have to deal with a just monumental economic crisis with incredibly high levels of, of unemployment. And something that I worry a great deal about is to make sure that our small businesses survive the pandemic uh, as we start reopening and get an economy up and running again. Uh, it is uh, very difficult to do that if small businesses are not in business. So that's why the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, the expansion 7A loans, all of that was so important. And I, I bring that all up because it came through the CARES Act, uh, which is uh, $2 trillion of relief, but it passed unanimously. So we did come together with that, and the two previous bills prior to that uh, brought that together. But I will say the, the frustration for me in working with supply issues, particularly, as you mentioned, uh, with states around the country, is that uh, we had an administration that basically said, every state, you're on your own. Go out there and fight uh, for what you can get. And we had a situation where governors literally had to compete and try to outbid each other for the supplies that were out there when the role of the federal government should be coordinating that. And that's what FEMA traditionally does. If you have a hurricane that hits a region of the country, FEMA uses its uh, purchasing power, the checkbook, to buy resources necessary to get through the, the crisis and to get people back up on their feet. And you do it in a coordinated regional way. That same concept uh, should have applied nationally. Uh, the difference being we had a hurricane that now swept across the entire country. And we had to have a national approach for that and understand, particularly at the very beginning of it, when we had just a few hot spots that were taking a, a tremendous uh, toll in terms of, uh, of uh, the disease spreading and deaths, uh, that you really have to treat that as a, like a triage situation in a hospital where you have limited resources and a lot of patients coming in. And you have to determine those who are the sickest uh, to get the help first and those you can, you can help survive. Uh, we were in that situation, and yet we didn't see uh, the, uh, the national response uh, coming from the administration necessary to do that, which caused a lot of confusion, caused a lot of problems. Uh, and even now, uh, I would certainly think that we should have a more coordinated response when it comes to testing supplies, for example, as, as the, the need for these supplies uh, actually are increasing as we're opening the economy. Uh, we need to make sure everybody has access to personal protection equipment, that people feel safe going out. Uh, in addition to opening up a business, you also have to make sure your customers feel safe to actually go to that business or the business can't survive. So we've got to deal with that public health aspect, and that includes testing uh, to make sure we know uh, who's sick and who's not, and people have the peace of mind to know they're not sick and they can go to work. You know, all of those uh, factors require a coordinated national response when you're dealing with a, a crisis of the magnitude that we're facing right now. Hindsight being what it is, you look at that, at that early scramble for resources that was in many ways disorgani disorganized on a, on a national level. And does that provide any sort of discussion within the, the Senate, bipartisan discussion within the, within the Senate, within the House of Representatives, within the entirety of the federal government going forward for the next pandemic? Because it may not be until another 100 years from now. It may be in the next 10 to 15 years. We don't know. Yeah. Is there no. anything in place now that's being discussed or that's being worked on that, that is down the pike that is going to prevent in the future these kinds of mad scrambles that cause severe issues throughout the country? Yes, there, there, there has to be a complete uh, after action uh, analysis of all that. Uh, my committee will be in the center of that where it's Homeland Security and Government Affairs. And uh, we're the top oversight committee for the U.S. Senate. So we do the oversight to make sure, one, that we're spending money appropriately and that it's, there's not uh, waste and fraud. Uh, but also, how do we uh, prepare for an emergencies going forward in a, in a more coherent fashion? So we definitely uh, have uh, to do that. We did have some pandemic plans uh, in place prior to this, uh, but there were cutbacks. Uh, those should never have occurred. Uh, so we're going to be looking back. You know, right now, I think we're in the phase now where we need to be thinking forward still about a potential resurgence uh, in the fall. So a lot of the efforts we're putting forward right now is just making sure we're taking care of the immediate needs. But you're absolutely right. There, there will be another pandemic. It's, uh, it's, un, it's part of human history. We've had pandemics uh, throughout uh, our history. We're going to have it again. Uh, there's also the likelihood, given the fact that the population continues to grow on our planet and we are more interconnected than human race has ever been, uh, that so the spread of a disease can, can occur a whole lot uh, more rapidly uh, than uh, had happened in the past where you could isolate people uh, more effectively than you can today. So this is a serious uh, issue. Uh, we're going to have to, I think there's a number of things uh, as we look forward. Uh, one, we have to make sure our stockpiles are, are large enough to, to deal with the kind of surge that we could see in another pandemic. But it really goes back to the point that I mentioned at the beginning, too, is that we have to have a resilient supply chain. 
we have to have manufacturers in the United States uh, making uh, critical supplies going forward. And uh, uh, for example, I mean, when, when it kind of came to testing supplies, one of the things that has been a limiting factor is just the production of cotton swabs. The cotton swabs that you put up your nose to get a, a sample, uh, there's only one manufacturer in the United States that makes those. They're mostly all made in China and we're relying on the Chinese. And when you're in a pandemic, every country in the world is also going to China trying to buy those that equipment as well. So we have to, to identify those key areas uh, and invest in those. It, it's really, it's related to what I do uh, as a member of the Armed Services uh, Committee, which oversees the military. And I think about constantly the supply chain for the US military. Uh, and for example, uh, we, we do not build U.S. Navy warships in China. We make sure we build them here in the United States of America. We make sure we have shipyards with the capability to build warships. Here in Michigan, right across the border up in northern in the UP, uh, uh, in Wisconsin, right on the border of Wisconsin and Michigan, we have Marinette Marine that makes the com uh, littoral combat ship and then the Navy's next generation frigate. You know, we have shipyards here to do that because we can't be dependent on another country uh, should we go to war. The same concept has to apply for life-saving drugs, uh, the medicines, the supplies, that we should not be dependent on another country for those kinds of life-saving supplies. We need to bring them back to the United States, take it back. Uh, it's good for jobs, employment, uh, at the same time it adds to our national security. So in my mind, it is a true homeland security issue and we have to make sure we have that kind of uh, resilience. So, you know, we've been, the economy has always been moving to a really, really uh, high efficiency, low cost, just in time delivery, which is great when times are good. But what we find out in a pandemic or in a crisis, you better have resilience too. You better have the ability to make sure you still have control of that supply or you can find yourself in real trouble. U.S. Senator Gary Peters with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Senator Peters, you recently released a 17-page report in regards to federal relief aid distribution from the Federal CARES Act, and it detailed some significant disparities in, in distribution of, of this aid. Provide an overview, please, on, on what those disparities are and, and how that impacted the response in the states that were affected. Well, uh, you're right, and it's part of, uh, again, out of the government affairs part of my committee, the oversight, so we wanted to, to see exactly how money is being spent uh, from the CARES Act uh, and substantial money going to health care providers. Uh, there's no question that they have been impacted in a significant uh, way, in a negative way, and it continues. Uh, uh, dealing with the COVID, our, our hospitals uh, had to stop uh, doing the uh, normal kinds of procedures that they do for patients, which pays most of their bills, and they had to free up beds for COVID patients. Uh, you also now are in a situation that even as uh, those cases have gone down, you still have people who are, don't feel comfortable going to a hospital because they're concerned about, uh, about COVID, and so they're facing significant financial pressure. Uh, we understand that, we need to continue to provide it, but we actually looked at the, the 170 plus billion dollars that was provided uh, in the CARES Act to help our hospitals and providers get through the crisis. Uh, and uh, as of the report date, which was just a short time ago, uh, over 40% of that money still had not been distributed to healthcare providers. And this is, this is legislation that passed back in March. Uh, we're now in July, we're talking over $70 billion. And as a result of that, you've seen a lot of our hospitals here locally in, in Oakland County and in Southeast Michigan, you've seen our hospitals lay off people uh, and furlough folks. Uh, it's estimated some 10,000 uh, healthcare providers have been laid off or furloughed uh, when money was available to keep those folks uh, in their jobs and uh, to restart uh, what is critical. The other aspect that was very concerning is that, uh, that because that money wasn't, has not and still hasn't been put out as rapidly as it should have been, it really puts our rural hospitals in a significant financial crunch. Already a large percentage of hospitals in Michigan prior to the pandemic, rural hospitals were considered to be in severe financial difficulty and may have difficulty surviving. And if they don't survive, uh, that puts rural residents at a, at a real, uh, problematic uh, place in that they have to go a very long distance to get some very critical uh, health uh, health uh, treatments uh, for them. And now with the pandemic and the fact that this money has been slow getting to those uh, rural hospitals, we continue to be very worried that many of them may not survive. U.S. Senator Gary Peters with us on the Oakland County Megacast that the national average of allotment aid from the Federal CARES Act to these hospitals was about $160,000 per patient. In the state of Michigan, your report found that that average was right around $31,000. That's no significant, that's, not, that's no small difference, that's a significant difference. How do financials get thrown that far off in aid that's this critical? 
Yes, and, and that is the other major finding uh, in the report too, as you mentioned, is the significant difference uh, per patient. And that's because of the, the way it was distributed out uh, just uh, across the geographic uh, uh, basis. And it was not based on the actual need of uh, particular hospitals and those that have been hit the hardest. So as you mentioned, the, the numbers for Michigan are considerably less per patient than you have uh, in other areas around the country. And one of the, with that finding, one of the recommendations is that we have to make sure that those places that have been impacted the most are the ones that receive the resources. The resources are meant there as emergency aid to help uh, uh, health providers and to help uh, localities that are being impacted by COVID. It's emergency aid. Uh, not just across the board blanket uh, money passed uh, all across uh, the country. It should be actually targeted to where the need is the greatest. Senator, if I can ask you a quick question, talking about those resources, a lot of people got the unemployment benefits and they needed those unemployment benefits. The federal benefits are scheduled to run out at the end of the month. Do you expect those are going to be extended? Because one thing I'm hearing from businesses trying to reopen is they can't get employees to come back because they're making more money with those federal unemployment benefits. Well, yeah, you're right. In addition to the uh, the normal uh, unemployment that uh, someone would qualify, there was a $600 per week uh, additional uh, payment made through the end of July. So at the end of this uh, month, uh, those will, uh, will go away. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the reasoning for the 600 was actually came from the administration. The, the original thought was that you'd replace whatever their income was would be replaced, uh, but it was an assessment made by the Department of Treasury that most of our state's unemployment systems are antiquated and that uh, to try to customize it to that extent, uh, the, at least what we heard from the Treasury Department, uh, was that it would delay the checks uh, sometimes substantially. And then certainly the, the initial thrust of the unemployment help was that folks needed money in their pocket as soon as possible. You know, a large number of folks in our country, uh, 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 after one paycheck is missed, they're in a fairly difficult position. And if two paychecks are missed, uh, it can be catastrophic for a lot of families uh, who've suddenly found uh, unemployment uh, uh, come uh, really out of the blue for them. So we had to get it quickly. I will say on the uh, 600, two, yeah, two questions there, on the $600 extra per week, you know, one thing that is very effective here in Michigan, and part of the law was to strengthen these programs, is a work share program. And so, if you uh, hire back, uh, or if you hire, if you hire back, if you offer a job to an employee who's who you laid off, they have to come back to work. So, or they lose their six hundred dollars. So they do have to come back for that. But if you want to bring in other folks with a work share program, you can actually bring people in. Uh, and, and a lot of businesses now don't need full forty hours; they need reduced hours. But if you bring someone in, uh, and they can work. Uh, uh, half time or more, uh, if they work 20, 30 hours a week, you pay them for that, but they still get their unemployment on top of that. So that's a really strong incentive. They, they can really make uh, even more money by coming back uh, to work. So there is a strong incentive uh, to do that. As to whether or not it'll continue beyond July, uh, that's still open to debate. The House passed legislation to do that. Uh, that uh, has, uh, we're in the process of hopefully uh, moving additional legislation for those areas that continue to need help. Uh, by the end of July, but we're, I'm back in Michigan now, we're in Michigan, I'll be in Michigan, and we're all back in our home states uh, for two weeks. And so during the, uh, the last two weeks of July, uh, it's our intent, uh, hopefully, to look at uh, various aspects of the CARES Act and take whatever action is necessary to help people get through the crisis. U.S. Senator Gary Peters joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. So there's been, we've talked extensively about the Federal CARES Act, about unemployment assistance from the federal government. Uh, also coming down the pike has been uh, the HEROES Act, a, a potential second, uh, second supplemental package from the federal government. We've heard Governor Whitmer talk about how that aid would significantly help uh, particularly funding our schools in the state of Michigan. So can you go into details about what the HEROES Act would entail in terms of aid and, and how that would benefit these states? Well, the HEROES Act is the, is the act that came out of the House, uh, which uh, uh, provides substantial resources for state and local governments, including uh, school districts. Uh, there's no question in my mind we need to make sure we're providing help to our state and local governments who are who have been impacted. Revenues have dropped uh, dramatically. If you think in, in this state, over 20% of the population's on unemployment right now, that's a massive number of unemployment and uh, not tax revenue that's not coming in. And yet a state needs to continue to provide services, first responders, law enforcement, uh, you know, that our local communities provide is all critical. And clearly education, uh, as schools uh, hopefully are reopening safely uh, in, in the fall, uh, but states don't have the same kind of 
flexibility the federal government has. The state of Michigan, for example, has a balanced budget amendment. So uh, in order to uh, compensate for those drops would mean uh, huge uh, cuts across the board to critical services that are provided to people uh, here in Michigan. And that's where the federal government can be uh, helpful to provide uh, those resources going forward. So uh, we're hoping uh, and uh, fighting uh, to get those resources in the package that comes out of the, the Senate. Uh, right now, the Republican uh, uh, caucus uh, in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, uh, uh, is not uh, as open uh, to providing that kind of help for state and local government. So we're going to we're going to try to negotiate and find some common ground so we can get it passed and get help uh, to where it's needed. U.S. Senator Gary Peters with us on the mega cast. Uh, Senator Peters, just a couple more minutes with you. Anything else that you'd like to touch on before we let you go today? Well, I think it's uh, it's important that we continue to stay focused uh, on uh, the need for all of us uh, in this crisis to make sure that the the numbers stay down. And you know, I, I, I get concerned with what we're seeing is the spike in cases, particularly in some of the the southern states in Florida and Arizona and Texas. And and I know it's natural. Uh, we all we all uh, want to get back to a, a new normal, but uh, it's really incumbent that all of us continue to practice the the kinds of uh, personal behavior that's really critical for us to to stop uh, the or to slow down, I should say, to slow down uh, the the spread of this virus. So wearing a mask, maintaining social distances, not accumulating in, in groups, uh, is still necessary because the virus hasn't gone away. It's still out there. Uh, there's a lot of concern that we may have a resurgence uh, in the fall uh, as well. And we have to make sure that we're able to, uh, one, not overwhelm our healthcare system with people who are very, very sick, and at the same token, also start getting our economy back going and, and running again uh, and, and start uh, getting back to whatever that new normal is. So uh, I just, uh, uh, whenever I get an opportunity to continue to, to mention that we still have to do our part, we have the power in our hands. Each one of us individually have the power in our hands to really minimize the spread of this disease uh, dramatically by wearing a mask and doing those things. And, and I would hope folks would remember when you wear a mask, uh, yes, you're, you're protecting yourself, but you're really protecting everybody around you. Uh, it's uh, everybody else uh, benefits from that mask. So it, when you wear that mask, you're making a statement that I care about society, I care about community, and I care about you. That's why I'm wearing a mask, because I don't want you to get sick and spread that around to other people in our communities. So I hope we all take that to heart, practice that, and know that together we're going to get through this. Well, Senator, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. U.S. Senator Gary Peters with us on the Oakland County Megacast talking about the Federal CARES Act, some, some issues in the distribution of the funding that that did affect our hospitals uh, in the state of Michigan and, and definitely in more rural areas, which didn't see a whole lot of COVID-19 cases necessarily, even at, at the peak in comparison to the large cities, but those resources even more critical there as they maybe aren't in a large health system and $31,000 in, in aid from the Federal CARES Act, as opposed to the national average of $160,000 is a significant disparity. You know what's so great about this program is being able to have some of these leaders on and allowing them the time to be able to talk in depth about some of these issues and these situations that are impacting us here locally. So it was great to have him on and hear from him directly as well. It was, and, and to get those details about how these different aid packages came to be, uh, what insight went into them, and even and even to an extent, what these issues we've seen come up uh, did to affect our society, how they came about, and what's being addressed at a federal level to look back on those now and definitely into the future to make sure that in the next pandemic, in the next crisis, we don't have those similar issues. And knowing that that's going on, I mean, you maybe don't hear about that in, in a typical five-minute interview you see all over the place with your U.S. Senator, with a U.S. Representative. And I do agree that one of the benefits of what we're doing here, what we're able to do on this particular pr program and, and our family of stations that support it is talk extensively with these leaders about these issues so that the public can get the insight they really need to have about what, what's going on and, and what are some of these issues that are popping up and why those issues amount in the way that they do. So, And what's so important, too, is you have to remember we have an election coming up. Yep. So these are the people that we have put in office to represent us, to make decisions for us, and to spend our money the way that is to, be, to best serve us as a public. And so if you want those changes, this is the time to hear from them and understand the decisions that they made, why they made them, and their thoughts going forward, because 
if you do like it, you do not like it, you have the power at the election polls. And so it's a reminder to everyone to exercise that right come November. It absolutely is. Whether or whether you agree with Senator Peters and his politics and his policies and, and whatever the case may be or not, in come November, or other candidates as well, or other people in office, whether you agree with them or not, you've got to get that insight and know who your representative is, whether you voted for them, whether you support them, whether you're going to support them going forward, that that's irrelevant in this situation. You need to know that information so that when you're going to the polls, you're making an informed decision about what's best for you and what's best for your community. So moving on, a, a transition here, just about 25 minutes left in today's program and, and uh, We've had a lot, a lot of things impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of businesses that have been impacted. One of the most affected have been gyms, especially in the state of Michigan in the last couple of weeks. Joining us now is an exercise physiologist and the CEO of Applied Fitness Solutions. Michael Stack joins us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Mr. Stack, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. So how are you, how's your team? My team is actually doing remarkably well. I have to say that I think that's probably one, been one of the highlights of this very challenging situation is just see to see how much our team and our community has rallied. I mean, we have a really strong culture and strong community in the first place. And I feel like this, this really challenging period has just magnified that a lot for me. And it's been really heartening to see how much everyone has pulled together to try to provide a very important service to people during a very challenging time. Gyms in the state of Michigan came oh so close to reopening just a couple mm -hmm. of weeks back. And at the 11th hour, about 9 o'clock at night, the night before they were scheduled to, to be able to reopen at 12.01 midnight, they were ruled to be closed once again. Your thoughts on the decision? Was it the right decision uh, at the state level for, the, for that to be, to be uh, for gyms to be closed? Can gyms, as of now, operate safely? And will people that are, go that are going to be gym goers, are they going to follow those guidelines? Yeah, that's, that seems to be the million dollar question. And I think I'm probably gonna take a somewhat contrarian approach to the rest of our industry here and say, I actually don't think at this point, gym should probably be open. And I say that as a gym owner that is losing a substantial amount of money day by day that we're not open. But I mean, the reality of the transmission of this virus is since it's transmitted through respiration and since indoor exercise or exercise in general increases respiration three to four times above rest, and we know that indoor environments are highly transmissible, I don't think it's appropriate at this point, based on what we're seeing in terms of the, the trajectory of the virus around the country, for indoor exercise to be happening to a great extent. So I actually am in support of you know, maintaining a, a more scaled back presence for our industry. Fitness is critically important. I mean, I think that this pandemic has really scaled up the importance of, of health globally. And certainly we all need to stay in shape and fit and healthy, but there are many different vehicles to do that through outdoor workouts, streaming workouts. I don't think it necessarily requires people to be back inside of gyms and fitness centers right now exercising until we have a little bit better of a handle on how to control the pandemic. Michael Stack joining us. He is the CEO of Applied Fitness Solutions. He's also an exercise physiologist with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So gyms, indoor gyms are closed. Outdoor exercise programs are still permissible in the state of Michigan. And, and uh, as, a as a result of gym closures, a lot more people are participating in outdoor fitness. Any particular benefits to outdoor uh, forms of fitness as opposed to maybe what you would do inside a gym or even inside your home? Well, I think certainly the one thing outdoor exercise has allowed us to do is gather people in a group again for exercise. Uh, each of my three facilities are running outdoor workouts with 50 to 100 people in each workouts. And the fact that we're doing them outdoors allows us to space people nine to 12 feet apart. It allows us to have that social element and camaraderie that people crave who come to our kinds of fitness facilities. And I think much of the benefit is that, that social element Beyond that, having a trainer that could be there with you to cue and correct and, and modify exercises as needed and motivate you is something that you just can't get quite as well through a virtual medium. So I think there are tremendous benefits in terms of just the execution of those workouts. Uh, I also think there's ample benefits just to being outside, getting sunlight, and certainly we know that outdoor exercise greatly reduces the transmissibility 
of the virus just simply because it allows the air to diffuse more. Sunlight definitely tends to inactivate the virus based on the research that I've read. So it seems like that's gonna be a great alternative for our industry in the state until we're actually able to get back open and start exercising inside of our facilities. Michael Stack joining us on the Oakland County Megacast, the CEO of Applied Fitness Solutions. For those who do partake in outdoor fitness, what are some things that they need to be looking for or, or be cognizant of for their own safety, especially given the, the, the weather outside? Yeah, I think that that's the conundrum we're kind of in right now is that this is a time where all we can do is exercise outside in the state in groups and as facilities, but obviously it's very warm out. I would say first and foremost, if you are exercising with some facility, they should be using guidelines from the American College of Sport Medicine that dictate when outdoor exercise is appropriate and, and what level of appropriate intensity should exist. Um, there's some information out there on heat and humidity as kind of like a cross section in a graph that tells you when outdoor exercise is actually contraindicated. So facilities have that information in general, if you're working out on your own outside, um, you should consider time of day, certainly working out earlier in the day or later in the day is better to working out midday when it tends to be the, the hottest and the most humid out. Uh, staying well hydrated is obviously critically important. I think you know, overhydrating yourself during this time of year with not just water, but maybe a substance like a Gatorade or a Powerade would be appropriate. Uh, people who are older, people who are obese, people who tend to have medical conditions need to be a little bit more cautious with exercising outdoors in the heat. I would say if you're anyone that falls into one of those categories, you should definitely consider exercising earlier in the day outside or trying to find a way to exercise in the shade. If you are working out in group settings, and this is something that we've been particularly challenged with with our clients because ours is a very close, affectionate community to a certain degree, is maintaining that social distance. Just because you're outdoors and you're exercising doesn't mitigate that, that social distancing that we all need to maintain. So even when you are exercising outdoors, making sure you're setting yourself up nine to 12 feet apart, you're maintaining those distances. I know we want to hug and I know we want to high five because that's the nature of a lot of fitness communities, but it's just not the appropriate time for that. So if there was ever a time to practice, you know, air high fives and air fist bumps, now's the time to do it just so we can maintain that, that safe social distance and be able to continue doing this one thing that we can do to work out in a group. Michael, if I can ask you, the weather right now allows us to be outside, but we are in Michigan. So if this continues, how do you think this is going to impact the industry if let's say it's December, January and fitness centers still are not allowed to reopen? Yeah, that's, that is a, a great question and certainly a real concern. That's something that I was just actually talking about with my leadership team earlier this morning. I think what it's gonna to amount to is we're gonna to have to once again, pivot as an industry to more virtual workouts. Either they could be streamed on YouTube or Facebook or on a platform like Zoom where you have a little bit more direct interaction. Certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the expectation of the fitness consumer such that now they expect a virtual or streaming offering to be part of their experience with a facility. And I think until there's a vaccine or really good therapeutics, as an industry, we may have to be prepared to bounce back and forth between indoor in-facility workouts, virtual workouts, outdoor workouts when it's appropriate during the year. And I think that that's just gonna be, you know, to use a greatly over used phrase the, the new normal in our industry for a while but it definitely is a concern particularly on the economic side of the equation certainly all of the brick and mortar fitness businesses make the vast majority of their money from workouts that are done in facility and they're simply not the the margins and the scale in virtual workouts that there are in in facility workouts so i suspect if this lasts in through the winter and there are closures of fitness facilities, you are gonna see a lot of fitness businesses having a very difficult time making it. Uh, fitness is not a high profit margin business. Our, our labor costs tend to be very high because we're a service oriented industry. Most fitness centers operate off a 20 to 25% profit margin. And just looking at industry statistics right now, they suggest that no more than about 45 to 50% of clients are willing to come back to facilities right away. And that, that in and of itself 
wipes out that really tight profit margin in the first place. So I think we definitely have some challenges ahead of us as an industry when we aren't going to be able to work out outdoors in groups like we are right now. Michael Stack with us, the CEO of Applied Fitness Solutions. He's also an exercise physiologist with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So, Michael, many people are still working out at home. Maybe they're not doing that through uh, a gym facility or they're not doing it through a, a specific workout program. And they're just looking up exercises, putting together some plans on their own and working out inside their home. Maybe they're trying for the first time. As an exercise physiologist and understanding the, the many ways that the uh, – that, that these at-home workouts that are being done by a novice or are not being done with the proper form can lead to, to issues. What do people need to consider when they're engaging in these at-home programs for their own safety and for their own physical gain going forward as they're developing their fitness? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting thing that we've seen through this is that there's definitely an uptick of certain orthopedic issues and, and injuries associated with indoor exercise. And I'll, there's a number of things to consider. I'll go over a couple things on a very, very basic level. First off, if you're not doing any exercise whatsoever right now, and you're looking to get into a program, maybe because you have more time because you're working from home, I think making sure that it's appropriate medically, if you do have any pre-existing conditions, particularly things like cardiovascular disease or any neurological disorders, just checking with your doctor first to make sure it's appropriate for you to begin an exercise routine is definitely a good place to start. Uh, from a really pragmatic standpoint, one thing I will say is make sure you set your exercise area up inside your home appropriately. Uh, I know I've seen issues that clients have had with the, turning an ankle on a child's toy that's on the ground or an animal running through and that causing someone to misstep and tweak their knee during a workout. I know that sounds pretty matter of fact and pretty basic, but the reality is, is we're used to an isolated area where we do our workouts. It's kind of free of all these other impediments and we don't have that now being at home. Uh, in terms of like the practicality of the actual workouts, I think that starting with body weight greatly limits the risk of injury for the vast majority of people. I would avoid trying to start with workouts that involve any sort of heavy resistance if you're just getting into it. I mean, maybe, maybe you have exercised in the past and you stopped for a period of time and now you're getting back into it. Making sure you do something that's at an appropriate intensity is very important right off the bat. And generally speaking, starting with your body weight is the best way to ensure that you don't overtax the body and cause some type of a tendonitis issue, which is often most common when people begin an exercise program. I would then say just build slowly. I think progression is the key to success in exercise. And I think if you always, when you start an exercise program, leave a little bit left in the tank at the end of a set or at the end of an exercise where you could have done a little bit more, but you didn't quite do that little bit more, it just allows you room to build into a progressively more intense exercise program. That typically is what gets most people when they start exercise is they just do too much too quick because they're motivated and they're overzealous and it results in a tendonitis type of an issue. I think the last thing you can do in terms of ensuring you mitigate the risk of injury or any other type of negative event is try to space out when you do your more resistance-based exercise. So if you are doing even body weight-based strength training, using bands or using dumbbells, trying to space that out every other day instead of every day is normally a good way to ensure your body recovers. And then on those days in between, perfect day to go for a walk or do some type of cardiovascular exercise. And I think last and, and probably most important is if something actually causes pain, stop doing it, assess why the pain is occurring, and then decide what the next most appropriate thing is to do from there. And if the pain persists, uh, there is a bunch of physical therapy companies that are doing virtual PT right now that can normally do injury assessment over Zoom, just like we're doing right now, and can give you an idea if you have injured something how you should modify your exercise program to ensure it doesn't exacerbate whatever you hurt. Michael Stack with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Before we let you go, anything else you'd like to touch on today? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the big thing, and I've kind of said this to, to everyone with regard to you know exercise and COVID-19 is just that you know we all need to focus on our health and our fitness. And when that can be done in gyms and fitness centers, it, it absolutely should be. But I think for the greater good of the public's health, that needs to be a, a very measured and progressive approach. Between now and then, 
there are lots of different ways for you to engage in activities to improve your health and your fitness and your well-being. And I encourage you to look at all of those different channels. And then when gyms and fitness centers do reopen, I think it's incumbent upon everyone to do an individual risk assessment as to if it's appropriate for you to go back in there. Um, I'll come flat out and say as a fitness facility owner that we can't completely eliminate the risk of contracting COVID-19 from coming in one of our facilities. We can do a lot to mitigate it, but we can't eliminate it. And you just have to make that individual risk assessment for yourself and decide if and when getting back in is appropriate for you and your family and the people that you're around. But that doesn't mean that you can't improve your fitness and your wellness. The, the one great thing that our industry has done is they have pivoted to this virtual medium. There are so many companies that are local like mine that are doing things through Facebook, doing things through YouTube. If there was ever a time to connect with a variety of fitness and wellness professionals virtually, that time is now. So experiment, find things that work. It's clear that, that COVID-19 and this pandemic is gonna be with us for a little bit. And we have to figure out a way to maintain our, our physical and mental health and well-being during this period of time. And there's no better thing to do that than fitness. We just have to do it through the appropriate vehicle right now. Well, Michael, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist and CEO of Applied Fitness Solutions with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a brief break and return with our last guest today, Pat Watson, coming up on the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Birmingham Area Municipal Access and Civic Center TV. 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. We're also on the Facebook page of the Auburn Hills Chamber of Commerce. They are our Facebook partner today, and we thank them very much for being with us. Our last guest on the program today is the superintendent of the Bloomfield Hills School District, Pat Watson, joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Superintendent Watson, thank you for being with us today. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, how are you? How's your team at Bloomfield Hills Schools? Doing well, preparing for what's going to be a very interesting school year. It, it absolutely is. G the governor and her Return to Learn Council released the My Safe Schools Plan last week at a press conference. Your thoughts on the uh, quote-unquote roadmap, as they called it, uh, and how does that make yours and other school districts' efforts in planning easier, tougher, maybe neither? Well, first and foremost, I appreciate the guidance. You know, obviously the governor and everyone that was on the task force that worked on the document spent a lot of time. And I also appreciate that there's a lot of leeway. So we know what we have to do is required. So that takes some of the guessing out of the game, right? So, you know, this is what you have to do. Then it's a matter of looking at the strongly recommended and the recommended uh, steps you could take and then making decisions as a school district, what is best for our students and our staff as we move forward. How does the governor's plans mix with Bloomfield Hill School District's plans? Will they have to, re will you have to rework some of your plans or does that kind of give you the guidelines and you're making your own and they fit together kind of nicely? So we had a pretty robust plan to begin with. We couldn't wait until we received guidance to figure out what we thought was going to happen and what we needed to do to move forward as a school district. So that includes moving forward and having a virtual option. So whether we're in school, you know, phases four, five, and six, or we're in phases one through three, we know a lot of parents want an online, you know, program for their students. So we've been working on that. And then as far as the additional guidance, we'll pair with the governor release and her roadmap back to school with the plans we already had to make sure we're in compliance. And then it's really working out those individual details of what is it going to look like. You know, she talks about having an area in each building for a student to be quarantined if you feel they're sick uh, and could have COVID or not have COVID. Um, as far as how are they going to get home and just some of the real small granular pieces 
that's really where our focus is going to turn. And that will take quite a bit of time to kind of plan and make sure we've got everything we need to roll out to the community and be ready when that first day of school starts. Pat Watson, the superintendent of the Bloomfield Hills School District. We've heard from some other school districts uh, that they've had concerned parents that have gone to them and said, regardless of what phase we're in, at least for part of the fall, I'd rather not have my kid in, in school at all. And, and they have provisions in place that if you if you want to have your kid do an entirely virtual learning in, in the fall, then, then that's okay. Is there a plan like that in place or something similar to that in place in Bloomfield Hills? There is. We're calling it Bloomfield Virtual. And so we'll have an information session coming out in the not too near future, uh, not too distant future, uh, uh, rather, so that parents have more information about it. But yeah, that's kind of what I said before. We really have to plan for those parents that want to keep their student home. And some is for health reasons. For other parents, they really feel their students learn better. Or for a couple, they even said, you know, I like having my child at home. I like being able to be uh, kind of the teacher or side by side and help my student along the way. So we'll have that opportunity, but they will have to commit. We'll have an August date where they'll have to make the decision whether they're going with the school plan, which is going to have some face-to-face -face learning, or they're going to end up going with the plan that is to be home. Uh, the only thing we're going to ask of the parents is that they either make a commitment for the semester or they make a commitment for the school year. It's just not feasible with staffing to have students, you know, spend a week in virtual learning a week off and go back and forth two days in, a week back in school. So that's something that we'll need. We'll need a commitment from the parent that they're going to be in. If the virtual learning program works, do you think this is something that the district would consider keeping post-pandemic? Absolutely. So a couple things. One, virtual learning is not new. So we know it's been around for quite some time. And there's been different schools that have done it. There's you know, schools that are simply K through 12 nationally that are completely online. But if it's something our parents really joy, uh, enjoy and their students are thriving in it, then it's definitely something we would consider keeping. I mean, our job is to educate our students, right? And if we have a significant or decent portion of parents who are saying, this is what works best for my family, then it's something we would definitely consider keeping. And I think that's pretty much consensus as I talk to people in Oakland County and outside of the Tri-County area is the same thing that if even post pandemic, if virtual learning is something their parents really and their students really enjoy, that they would look for a way to keep it as well. On the upcoming ballot, ballot Pat, Pat Watson, superintendent of Bloomfield Hill Schools, there is a bond issue coming up for the Bloomfield Hill School District. Explain to us uh, briefly how that bond will, would serve the, the school district and where those funds would go. Yeah, so every single building would be touched uh, would give us an opportunity to refurbish some of the buildings that were built in the 1950s and 60s, and they were built for education at that time. And we know education has completely evolved and changed, and we really need 21st century buildings to kind of do what we're trying to do educationally. It would include upgrades to safety, um, so whether it was the Sally Port entranceways or additional cameras. Um, you always think of things like that for safety. Um, but another thing we're looking at with the safety is relocating all the offices to one spot so that when you go down, you have the principal's office, you have the secretary, you have the school social worker, you have the school psychologist. And a lot of our buildings are really spread out. There's also not a room for a student to have a private conversation. So if a student would come down really upset, that conversation also sometimes has to take place almost in the hallway or just inside the door of the office instead of in a private area. Um, so that would be a couple of the big things. Also, it would give us the ability to right-size the school district. Right now, we have 5,500 students in three middle schools. Based on the number of students that we have, we really need to be at two. And that would allow us to go back to a K-5, 6-8, through five, six through eight, and 9-12 through 12 configuration. Right now, we have some middle schools that are 4-8 through eight or 5-8, through eight, just simply to fill those spots because of the size of the building. So looking at it from a fiscal standpoint, it really allows us to recapture some of those funds by consolidating into two middle schools and then making sure we use those funds for educational programs for all of our students. And Pat, where can people find more information on this bond issue? So if they go to bloomfield.org, they'll be able to find information right there. Uh, the bond was originally scheduled for a May vote, but we made the decision that it was in the best interest of everyone, including those that would have to go into work and open all the you know votes that were cast that we move it to August. 
And so we're cautiously optimistic. We did watch the May vote and we did see that there were between intermediate school districts and different school districts that there were 29 uh, potential yes votes out there in 29 different areas. And so all 29 school districts or ISDs did pass their bonds, so 29 for 29. And we also did a little research on March and looked locally, and we know that Birmingham passed a bond in March for 200 million, and that Pontiac Schools passed a bond for $147 million in March, uh, with 75% of their community saying yes. So we're cautiously optimistic about you know going forward with the bond for August vote this year. Well, we'll keep up on that information and more about the Bloomfield Hills Schools bond issue with Pat Watson. Thank you for being with us today. That is going to do it for our, our program today. You, you have been listening to the Oakland County Megacast and watching it on our family of stations. Ronnie and I will return tomorrow.